frozen to the bone There's darkness in your soul Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and here we are. Oh my god, the dark web. Uh, this is a Spider-Man X-Men crossover that came out, like, started back in end of December and went all the way to February, end of February, and I'm so glad it's over because I was buying it weekly, and I was I started reading them weekly, and then I got really bored of it and just waited till the end, and then went back and binged them all, and then recorded one set of videos in a different order, and I didn't like them, and I tried to keep them really brief, and they didn't come out too well. So I said, screw this, I'm gonna kind of combine a bunch of issues in one video so I can kind of get through this. And I know normally I like to do a little bit deeper dives on some of these comics, but man, I, I'm sorry, I don't feel like these books are really worth that. And uh, and you'll see more of my opinion uh, you know, in regards to that as we go through this, because this was a tough event to get through. As an X-Men fan and as a Spider-Man fan and as a Venom fan, I do have digital copies of these to give away. So as I talk about the books, any of these that came with a free digital copy, I'll post up on there, but not all of them did as far as I remember. But in this episode, we're going to talk about Dark Web Dusk, number one. This is the beginning of the crossover event. So big issue here by Zeb Wells and Adam Kubert. Uh, then we also have uh, Dark Web X-Men, number one, by Rob Reyes and uh, Jerry Duggan. So we're going to get into that. Uh, we're going to get into Dark Web Miss Marvel, number one. And uh, forgive me, I forget who the uh, creative team on this is. It's Sabir Perzada and Francisco Mortarino. So hopefully I'm saying those names right. I'm sorry if I'm butchering those. Um, and then also Dark Web, Mary Jane and Black Cat, number one. And this is by Jed McKay, who is killing it on uh, on Moon Knight right now. And Vincenzo Carutu. Uh, and again, I could be butchering these names, so I apologize if I am. Um, but great stuff. We're going to get into all these. And then lastly, we have Zeb Wells and Ed McGinnis on Dark Web, Amazing Spider-Man number 15. So these are the five issues we're going to discuss in this episode. So let's get right into Dusk number one, and I'm gonna kind of have some other footage hopefully pop up of me flipping through the pages to kind of give you a closer shot of some of the artwork. But this book, like it starts off, Ben Riley is having these hallucinations. He fell asleep while he's down in limbo, because that's where we left off with him on the road to Dark Web here, is that he's now in limbo with Madeline Pryor, and his girlfriend Janine just got powers and has become All Hallows Eve. And the three of them are on the verge of invading Earth and sending demon spirits to possess machinery and, and newspapers and mailboxes and cars and trucks and everything. Uh, all these things are going to be uh, taken over by demon spirits in the world of in New York City. Um, so it's kind of like the event Inferno, uh, the first Inferno from the 80s. But then I guess they did another Inferno a couple years ago. Uh, that's just kind of my thing with X-Men books now. It just feels like they're trying to regurgitate old stuff while not really with this like new status quo of the x-men and it's to me it's not really working that well so um so yeah so we have this team of these two clones madeline Pryor and ben riley two people who feel like they've been wronged although madeline is still she was doing good for a while like magic the character magic has kind of come along and tried to save her and and magic used to be in charge of limbo and then gave it over to madeline and said look i need to get out of here i need a break you know it takes a lot out of you to run this place, but I trust you, Madeline, and I think you would be a good person to be in charge of Limbo, um, and that kind of keeps her out of the X-Men's hair, but it also gives her a purpose, which she was looking for. So now that she's down here, though, she ran across Ben Riley, who you know found his way into Limbo, and they realize what they have in common, and they decide to go get revenge on the surface world and on the people that hurt them. So the X-Men for you know Madeline Pryor and Spider-Man for Ben Riley. So that's pretty much the setup, and then there's this really cool moment at the beginning where they go to a, a birthday party for Harry Osborn. For those who haven't been following our channel, we talked about the Nick Spencer run. Harry Osborn was a clone during that run, it turns out. That was the big reveal at the end. And he died saving Norman, who is now a good guy uh, because all of his sins have been taken away from the Sin Eater. So now Norman is kind of trying to do the right thing here and he's become the Gold Goblin, as we, again, we've talked about in previous episodes. So there's a lot to catch up on. If, if this, this is your one of your first videos of mine you've seen and you haven't read current Spider-Man or X-Men comics, there's so much to catch up on. So check out my Road to Dark Web. It was four, uh, four episodes, so go check that out and it'll kind of catch you up on everything. Um, so yeah, they're having a birthday for Harry. He, he has passed away now and most people don't know that the Harry that died recently was a clone. So Peter's decided to just keep that information hidden from everyone. 
but still thought it was a nice thing to celebrate Harry's life on his birthday, um, you know, the first birthday after his passing. So that's what everyone's doing, and everyone's there, but uh, Norman isn't. He's standing outside in the cold, uh, but he bought, he paid for the whole event. He's, everyone's drinks are on him kind of thing, and Peter goes out and has a heart-to-heart -heart with him, and he's like, yeah, I remember, you know, my clone son died in my arms, almost like the way Ben Riley, your clone, died in your arms, and so there's like a, a connection there between Peter and Norman now, and they're trying to find a way to work together and move forward. And uh, Kamala, actually, Miss Marvel, she's an intern at Oscorp, and she's an assistant to Peter Parker there, too. So we're going to get into her story here coming up very soon. But anyway, so the invasion begins. Madeline Pryor plays her piano, sings her song, and uh, and in, in doing so, she reveals that she has captured Venom, because in the last where we left off Venom, Eddie Brock has shown up in limbo, and now... Madeline Pryor has control of him and she has wiped away his memories, turning him back into a mindless creature like he kind of was in the beginning in the comic books when he was a villain and he was okay with protecting people, but he hated Spider-Man. So that's the state they return him to and Madeline even says, oh, oh I think I took away too much of his, uh, of his personality and now he's, you know, which I don't know why Ben is okay with this. Ben is going after Spider-Man because he believes Spider-Man took away some of his mind. So why he's okay with Madeline taking away some of Eddie's mind, I don't know. Um, like I said, this story is kind of all over the place to some extent. But everything in here, like all the, you know, inanimate objects are becoming animate. They're being uh, taken over by demons. Uh, everything from carriage rides to trying to eat the passengers inside of it to mailboxes, which we saw previously in uh, the free comic book day issue. So this triggers Spider-Man and all the heroes to jump into the battle and, and you know, try to save everybody. So Spider-Man does, uh, so do the X-Men, who happen to be visiting New York at the same exact time, so big coincidence there. And that's when Magic starts realizing what's going on and that these demons are from Limbo and that they need to go talk to Madeline Pryor. So, um, and then at the very end of this book, which I really love, Spider-Man um, is out fighting demons and everything like that. You're going to see where he is in the next issue. And sorry for the change real quick, the light change. Uh, my two lights here all of a sudden died at the same time. So you probably saw it just getting darker and darker in this room for the past few minutes. And I'm sorry, I didn't even notice. So I have a new light going on here. So let's dive back into the book. All right, so where we left off, Norman Osborn is at his office. Chaos is happening in New York. And he's like, you know what? I could help out as the Gold Goblin. So let me suit up and go out there. But before he does... Ben Riley shows up and says, I don't know if you remember me, and I have trouble remembering a lot of stuff myself, but I remember a lot of the bad things because that kind of stuff just sticks with you. So I remember you, Norman Osborn. I remember you manipulated me. You made me think I was real Spider-Man, and then you killed me, and I died in Peter Parker's arms. And he's like, so now I'm back, and I'm here to really screw you up. And boy, does he. And I don't want to ruin every beat of how he gets the jump on Norman, but it's pretty clever considering he's a clone of Spider-Man. He used that to his, his advantage, uh, you know, because considering... Spider-Man works for Norman, so it's pretty cool. So I won't get into all the details there, but um, but it's a lot of fun. And then the book ends where we reveal that Venom has had a little bit too much taken out of his personality, and now he's running around uh, looking for Spider-Man to eat his brains. So that's where the Dark Web dusk ended, and at first I was like, okay, I'm not totally on board with this. It seems really silly and kind of just like been there, done that on some level, but I'm invested in Ben, and I hate that he's Chasm, but... I'm still invested in that character and I want to see where it goes from here. And I want to see if Madeline really has lost her way and turned fully bad. I started to you know, find myself a little invested in that too as a longtime X-Men fan, not someone who's been you know, keeping up with it lately. Although I did like recently when Magic kind of gave the throne of Limbo to her. Um, that was kind of cool. And they do mention where uh, you know Magic got the powers from to control Limbo. They uh, talked about the demon she had banished and defeated. And I bring that up because he will be coming into this story at a certain point here later in this episode. So then we have Dark Web, X-Men number one. And this one was just kind of meh. I mean, I don't know, Jerry Duggan, sometimes when he writes stuff, I'm on board. And then sometimes I'm just not. And this book, I feel like it was just a way to get Spider-Man and his amazing friends back together. So Spider-Man, Firestar and uh, Iceman all team up in this one, while the X-Men with magic and everything, they go get Havoc, and it's Jean Grey, Cyclops, Havoc, and Magic, and they decide they're gonna go into Limbo and look for Madeline Pryor, who has not yet shown herself on Earth, um, but she is on Earth. She is with All Hallows' Eve, and they're trying to hunt down Venom because he's supposed to be doing her bidding, and he kind of went off his leash. So they are looking for Venom because they need to rein him in and have him do something, uh, before Ben, you know, so Ben can wrap up his things that he needs to do, and then the final act of their invasion can take place. So in this, though, you have them walking around looking for Venom, 
You have the X-Men going down to Limbo to look for Madeline. And then you have Spider-Man teaming up with his amazing friends, fighting a giant Christmas tree. And I do like Rod Reyes' artwork. Um, it's it's really He's really good. He's been killing it for years. He's done a lot of stuff. Some books that I actually, when I worked in comic books and worked with my friend Omar, um, there was stuff that you know Omar was working on that had Rod attached to it. But that was a lifetime ago. But again, I've always been a fan of his stuff. I like his artwork. So it looks good here. And that's the thing is about this event. This event had a lot of really good artists on it. But I've, and I had some good name writers on it too, but I just, I don't know, I wasn't finding myself pulled into this. It just, it feels very bland, it, you know? Um, I will say this though, I've talked about this before with other crossover events where something happens in one book and it doesn't really happen in other or it contradicts something that happens in the other, like Miles getting a symbiote in one and then the next issue, you know, in uh, the Absolute Carnage, he was kind of independent of that and, and not really talking about it. Um, so, or they ended the book with him you know, like, I took over the Carnage symbiote. I can fight back now against Carnage. And the next issue, he doesn't have the symbiote anymore. So there's there was bad stuff like that um, in those Venom crossovers and stuff that Donny Cates did and the editors on that on the, those books. But this, I will give him credit for. When something happens in a book, it happens in another book. So Norman sends out a call for Peter at the end of this book when he's getting beat up by Ben. And then near the end of this book is when Peter gets that call. So he decides, okay, I, I'm done teaming up with the amazing friends. I'm going to go off and look for Norman. So while he's going off to go to, to look for Norman, Miss Marvel is shows up and sh she's at Oscorp. She sees that Ben Riley or whatever has beaten up Norman Osborn and has infiltrated the building. Now demons are taken over. So uh, and then some enemies from uh, Miss Marvel's past, the recent past, are being reanimated too because they're kind of machinery like. And so they're going after Kamala. Um, so yeah, so there's there's some neat setup here, but then they get into the stuff where this guy at work wants to ask Kamala on a date, and then he's like, hey, I'm Hindu and you're Muslim, is that cool? You know, like, is it cool that I ask you out? And she's like, yeah, I don't care. You know, like, I dated this person, I dated a white guy, it's just like, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you know, what matters is that you don't turn into a villain and try to kill me, basically. So it's kind of building their relationship up. I'm guessing that's something that might be happening in her book. So they're just trying to, you know, put those threads in there. And then, like I said, demons take over. They start taking over the building and Kamala turns into Miss Marvel and starts saving everyone, including the guy who was hitting on her. Um, but she's destroying like, you know, different Oscorp tech and all this other stuff. And she's fighting back. And what's really cool is that the events in this do lead to another book. So like as she helps save people at Oscorp and does what she can to get everyone out of the building safely, she then goes out into the streets of New York and runs across Chasm. And, uh, and then confronts him, and they have a conversation. And that same conversation is copy and pasted into this Amazing Spider-Man book. So we'll get to that, because first we got to dive into Dark Web, Mary Jane, and Black Cat. And again, I'm just going over some of the beats here, and just kind of how I feel about some of the beats. Nothing really super detailed, and I don't want to show off the whole books, because obviously I want you guys to maybe go read some of these for yourself. Although, I, I don't know, I, at the same time, I feel like I always like encouraging people to make up their own mind. But I didn't like this run so much that uh, I almost don't want to encourage people to go buy it. Uh, but if you're out there and you're a purist in a collection, you know, you want all this stuff in a collection, you know, the trades will be coming out soon. So you can pick them up that way. And I will say at least these first couple issues, although kind of bland, I didn't feel like any, nothing upset me as far as being a reader and a fan goes. Nothing crossed the line in these where I started really disliking this book. Not at least in this first episode. But we will be getting to those in the next few episodes for sure as we get further into Dark Web. Because by the end of it, I just full on hated the book and questioned its existence. So that's how much I didn't like it. Uh, but at least here, that's still having fun. And Jed McKay, he has a ton of fun writing these two characters, I think. You know, Mary Jane and Black Cat are really interesting characters that, and they've kind of taking a life of their own because Mary Jane used to be just the girlfriend who sat on the couch in the 90s and cried waiting for Peter to come home um, and then now you know like with Aunt May she, you know after Aunt May died they brought her back but they put her in feast and they had her you know uh, they gave her a life of her own too she you know ended up with Jonah's you know, father and uh, and started having her own life a new love life of her own and so they actually did things with Aunt May and same with Mary Jane They've, over the last like 10 years or so, they've actually done stuff with the character that I'm like, okay, cool. Although I don't like her and Peter not being together, but now she's, you know, with this guy named Paul and they have two kids together apparently. And Mary Jane has superpowers, uh, kind of like jackpot style. It's almost like a, a coin machine or a slot machine, you know, coming up with the three symbols and depending on how they match up depends on what kind of power she gets. So sometimes she gets lucky and she has enough power to save her family, I guess, because um, we still don't know the, co the full connection between her Paul and the kids. 
um, or that we might now, the book might be out now because I'm so late, you know, reviewing these. But, uh, but yeah, so she's getting different powers and then some objects come and take her away and Black Cat has to go help her and save her. And then Mary Jane, once again, you know, rolls another lucky and is able to get some powers to fight back. So that's kind of her thing and she hasn't told Peter about it yet. Um, Paul does know about it. The kids apparently obviously know about it now if they didn't before, um, but Peter doesn't know. So they have this heart to heart conversation and Black Cat wants to confess to Mary Jane like, hey, last time we talked, uh, you know, during the Beyond story, I told you I wasn't gonna pursue being in love with Peter, but everything, ever since things changed with you two over the past year, um, and you know, now Mary Jane's with Paul, you know, and everything like that, Black Cat has been teaming up more with Peter during the Tombstone arc and everything after that we've been covering leading up to the Dark Web here. And Felicia now wants to have a relationship with Peter, and she even, you know, kissed him, and they're, you know, they're gonna go on a date and stuff. So it's, which I'm cool with, you know, like I, I, I like Peter being with Mary Jane, um, but uh, I don't know. I, I've been following Felicia's, you know, stories these past few years, and I think they're doing a lot with that character. And Peter just seems to be that character they keep trying to bring back to level one, which I really don't like. So if they do this with Black Cat, I hope it's a commitment, like a like a long term commitment. Um, I don't want to see Black Cat die, you know, and that just makes another love interest for Peter die, you know, like die in his arms. I don't want to see anything like that. I want if they do this, they need to really try. It's like when. DC said Batman and Catwoman were finally going to be together. I'm like, then do it. And then they kind of didn't. I mean, they do in one book, but not, not in any other books. And that's like, I hate that lack of commitment. It's like, just do it. You broke them away from Mary Jane. Have them be happy with someone for crying out loud. Uh, so anyway, so these two talk and they have their moment. And before they can, you know, Black Hat can actually confess what happened, they get sucked down into limbo. And, uh, and they're wondering what they're doing down there. Mary Jane gets a weird, unlucky power, but she still tries to use it to her advantage. Uh, and her and Black Cat take on a bunch of demons. And then that's when the demon that originally gave Limba over to, uh, to Magic, Belasco, he shows up and he says he wants to work out some kind of deal with the two girls here. So we're going to get more into that in the future books of that story for sure. Um, but then we're going to end this episode jumping back into Amazing Spider-Man. This is issue number 15, and this is where the first part of this chapter, I feel like, is a good place to close on because now you have Ed McGinnis artwork here, which is really good. I like Ed McGinnis, and you have this little cradle that is holding this baby, this carriage, and it's going to eat the baby. Uh, so the parents, like, you know, get the baby and save it, and then Venom shows up to save the baby. And it's kind of one of those moments where Venom in the alley with the lady who got her purse snatched, and he kind of patted her on the head. Venom saves the baby, then picks it up and gives it a kiss on the cheek. And is like, yes, don't worry, citizens, I'm here to save you, and I'm going to look for Spider-Man and eat his brains. So it's kind of like old-school classic Venom, which I don't like. Um, they do give a reason for it, at least. But I don't like it overall. But it's still that moment, at least, I thought was fun. Um, so Spider-Man has now left teaming up with the Amazing Friends, you know, swinging away from Central Park and or wherever that the giant trees were that they were fighting. And they're, he's heading to Oscorp. And when he gets there, that's when he runs into Ben Riley, And he realizes that Ben is the one behind this, along with Madeline Pryor. And he's like, wait, no, I thought you were still a decent person. I thought, you know, I've been looking for you for weeks. And he's like, yeah, well, I'm with Madeline now and we're doing this. And my girlfriend Janine is out there and I beat up Norman now. You know, he's standing over Norman's body. And he's like, and don't worry. He's like, uh, you know, we'll have this heart to heart soon, but you have other things on your mind. And he's like, what are you talking about? I don't sense any danger. And he goes, of course you can't. You never sense when he's coming. And that's when Venom shows up and they get into a big fight. And now granted, I am not a fan of the story of this and what's going on on a certain level. This is definitely the book where I'm, it's losing me because I feel like Ben, I don't understand why he's acting like this. He's, he's really committed to just ruining Peter's life and destroying New York, I guess. And I don't understand, like I really feel like they did a bad job leading up to this explaining, like they definitely tried to explain it, but I Ben is Ben Riley. Like, I didn't like him when he was the Jackal either. I thought Dan Slott did a really piss poor job explaining that. And then Peter David did a whole 25 issue story arc to try to get Ben back into being Ben again. And then in Spider Geddon, they kind of in just like two panels fixed him back to factory settings. So if he's back to factory settings and then lost some of his memories, I just don't understand the leap he's made into this level of villainy. I just don't get it. Um, but anyway, the artwork is phenomenal because Ed McGinnis drawing Venom and Spider-Man is a lot of fun so these two fighting is is great and then Ben 
completes what he's trying to work on. He finds this amulet, he finds this book, and that's when Kamala shows up, Miss Marvel, she's over here, and they talk and they have the same exact conversation that they had in Miss Marvel number one, Dark Web. So again, like editors did pretty good lining all this stuff up, at least in these first five issues. I thought they did a good job with that. So I wanna point that out because it's something I nitpick on in the other crossovers. And in this one, at least in this episode, I feel like they did a good job keeping everything kind of situated and compartmentalized very well. But then when they meet, they did a good job doing that too. So yeah, big fight between Spidey and Venom. So if you're just hankering for a cool throwdown fisty cuff fight between these two characters, this is a good issue to pick up, Amazing Spider-Man 15. Um, but it does end with one of them being defeated. Um, and then, you know, Ben Riley goes and picks on Jonah, grabs him. He's collecting people from Peter Parker's life. And then he ends up at the end coming face to face with Spider-Man himself. And he's like, hello, Peter, where were we? So, um, yeah, and I like this, this costume of Chasm. I think he looks cool. There's some toys coming out. I'll flash some images up that they just announced from Marvel Legends that are coming out, and there's going to be a, a Chasm one and a Ben Riley from the Beyond story, at least a, kind of. It doesn't look exactly like him, but it's, you know, close enough. But, yeah, so I am I like the Chasm look. He looks interesting. But if they would have made it Spider-Side or, or a, you know, a different character, not Ben, not Kane, I would have probably bought into it more or liked it more. That could have been a cool way to bring Spider-Side back. They always talked about doing a Spider-Side 2.0 and we never got it. This could have been a cool way to do that. And then you could have still brought Ben and, you know, Kane into the story somehow. But I just feel like they don't know what to do with those characters. And this, for some reason, made the most sense to the editors. And I just don't know if I agree with it. I, I don't. And, and so far in this storyline, though, I haven't disliked anything major. I'm like, well, I don't like Ben and what he's doing, but this is still only five issues in, so... I imagine they're going to do a better job of explaining why he's going down this road. And I feel like the one thing this book just never accomplishes, at least to me, is selling me on the fact of why Ben is acting the way he acts. But we'll get into that more in future episodes, so make sure you stay subscribed so you don't miss out. For those of you who want more in-depth conversation about Dark Web, after I get my four videos up reviewing the entire series, I will be talking to someone, we'll have a guest on the show, and we'll do kind of like what we did with Eddie's mullet, we'll have a conversation about Dark Web and go into those beats. So considering that won't happen for another couple weeks or maybe till the end of the month or even into April, whenever that happens, I think it's far enough away for us to get into full spoilers by that point. So if you agree or don't agree with what I said, whatever it is, let me know down below. And as always, we'll keep talking down there. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you in the future. Peace.